I'm here because I am a roaring lion crying out righteousness. Welcome everybody to the Trust in the Lord Hour. I am your trusting in the Lord host, and I am trusting in the Lord. What about you? Uh, so we've been covering a lot of territory, uh, spiritually, universally. We've been able to look at the geographical regions of, um, of heaven, uh, its purpose, um, we, um, and, and earth, and the, um, the resting place or the, re the return destination of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think one of the th more profound things that we've been able to, uh, to implant into the, the teachings by way of revelation is that uh, Jesus will not be returning to Jerusalem, uh, and that's for everybody that um, that thinks perhaps he will he will not be coming to Atla. But it's clear that he tore the temple down uh, in verses one through three of Matthew's Gospel, chapter twenty-four. So he will not be returning to a torn-down temple. Um, and so you can doubt whether he's coming back to Atla, but for just a moment. Let's say that what I'm saying is true, uh, that Jesus has planned and he has it's been a part of his plans, uh, knowing all things, and he didn't reveal Atla to any of the angels or to any of the prophets until he revealed it to me back on the 14th of September, 1991. And let's for, you know, for angels advocate and Holy Ghost advocate say that, that is true. Then what does that mean? Well, I think we've looked at several things regarding uh, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. One, he's not coming back until after the tribulation has run its course. And in today's teaching, I want to be able to discover or at least teach more aspects of what's going to happen to both saved and unsaved people in the aspect of the tribulation. Uh, and then the other item that we have looked at and we looked at, which I, I think that most preachers, religious leaders, uh, not being chosen also have been very hesitant of saying to you that once the tribulation begins, the, uh, the door of salvation is closed. And let's say, for instance, you don't believe that, you don't believe we're in the tribulation, you might be you know, one of those per person looking for a red heifer to run across the, the, the floor of the uh, temple that isn't, it doesn't exist anymore in Israel. You might be one of those persons looking for the red heifer to run across the floor of the temple that doesn't exist anymore. Neither one of those things exists. So you don't believe we're in the tribulation. All right, but I don't think that you're in this crowd. There might be some people that you're going to have some interaction with later that believe that red heifer thing. But let's say, for instance, uh, you were to, to, to believe that Jesus is, is going to return and come back to Atla. Exactly what does that mean? It, 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 at the very least, it means he's not coming back to Jerusalem. He, he did, and one of the reasons why he tore down the temple was to let people know that that's not where he's coming back to. That there was no other reason to tear it down. What's on the temple ground right now, if geographically, in, in terms of structures on the on the uh, the uh, on that particular ground, is the Al Aska Mosque, the Muslim Mosque. I guarantee, you, I, I bet my last dollar that well, I'm not a betting man, but I, that he's not coming back to that mosque. I guarantee, when Jesus comes back, my brother, he is not coming back to that to that Al Aska Mosque, and I, I, that's on Temple Mount now. That's what's there. The temple was torn down. It's been replaced by the El Oscar Mosque, the Muslim boys. I guarantee you, homie, he ain't coming back there to that mosque. 
But the other thing is this, is that you need to think more critically uh, as we began to look at the fact that the door of the tri salvation has been shut. And if the tribulation starts, salvation ends. When the work of the Holy Ghost is complete, Jesus returns. So when Jesus comes back, he's not coming back, you know, to start salvation or teaching of the parables and doing miracles and, you know, dealing with an adulterous woman and dealing with a blind man by the pool of Bethesda. That is not what he's going to do when he comes back. It will be like he didn't finish the work. He said in the sixth word on the cross, it is finished. He's not coming back to do that work. So if you're not saved before he gets back, he gave a beautiful, a powerful, in, undisputable, unmitigating example. If you're not saved when he gets here, there ain't no salvation possibility. And he gave that in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 1 through 12, in the parable of the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish, and the five fools, which way they were. The five fools, and he used the term fool rather than unsafe. He used the term fools, and I'm going to cover that as well. He told them, you, weren't, you, didn't get, you didn't get your oil before I came. Now that I'm here, the opportunity to get your oil is over with. The door is shut, and I don't know you are who you are. That's I, I'm going to get to. I've been promising to get to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, and go through the entire chapter. But the thing I also want to express is that he didn't call the five versions that were who did not get saved. And again, the emphasis here: the tribulation has already begun, so salvation is no longer truly possible. There may be an exception where. Uh, I can bind on earth your salvation. That, that possibility does exist according to the authority that Jesus gave to Peter in Matthew's gospel chapter 16. To bind on earth what heaven will go along with. But he called them fools. And because they had the opportunity he can't, they had, he they were there with the five the other five virgins the other five virgins did what they're supposed to do got their oil and their lamps but the others did not so Jesus in his parable didn't call them unsaved or whatever or young he called them fools and quite frankly when Jesus calls you a fool you're a fool <laughs> when Jesus calls you a fool you are a fool and that's what he called them he said five were wise and five were foolish. And the interpretation there is that they had the opportunity. You know, there are a lot of people that listen to me uh, and still don't have any oil in their lamps. Like the, like the wise people, there are people that come to listen to me every day. Many of them are wise and have oil in their lamps, but many of them have no oil in their lamps. They haven't joined the ministry. They don't support it. They wouldn't give a red nickel to the ministry. They just won't do it. <laughs> They'll go to the Olive Garden and order extra salad and extra wine, or they'll go shopping and they'll buy two pairs of things for themselves and then buy something for their friends. And then they'll come and they'll log on to the broadcast and in 10 years haven't sent a dime. Wouldn't send a dime. Jesus calls that fool, calls you a fool. The, the issue here is that what are we going to do about the people now that the tribulation has already begun because we're in it right now. They're in it right now. We're in it right now. What are we going to do about all the unsaved people? And I want to be able to cover that uh, and give you the biblical examination. But I first want to demonstrate to you that once the bridegroom cometh, and Jesus is coming after the tribulation, but the tribulation the, the, the tribulation in terms of explanation of what it is, the tribulation is what Almighty God has decreed to destroy all of creation, everything that he created. Um, and you may not have thought about this, but heaven and earth both will be, will be destroyed and heaven will pass away and earth will pass away and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You know about that. Um, 
and there's going to be a new Jerusalem. Now, by that, it means that the Jerusalem that was old, when you heard the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that is old is not going to be Jerusalem again. There's going to be a new Jerusalem, and the new Jerusalem is Atla. This is the new holy place, Atla. And the um, and then the deduction, and when you're listening to one, listen to me prophesy and teach as I'm teaching. I'm only going to use Bible and biblical examples. That's that's all I'm, I'm going to use. The Word of God. I'm not going to use any doctrinal, denominational. I'm only going to use the Word of God. So if you have a disagreement with me, your disagreement will be with the Word of God. The only place, the only error, the only space where you would find yourself disagreeing is with Atla itself that God spoke it in 1991, that is the land where the people shall walk barefoot because the land is holy ground, and that when Jesus returned, this is the place it's coming back to. Now, you can argue with that. You can disagree with that. You can even dispute that if you so choose. And you would be within the sense of normality. But the reason why you would dispute that, especially after listening to such thorough teachings that I do, is because you don't have the Holy Ghost. You don't have the Holy Ghost. Now, let me say this as well. The people that hear me and receive me, and when you have the Holy Ghost, you cannot help but love what we do here, uh, give and support. You follow the structures of support of this man. When you have the Holy Ghost, you you when you have the Holy Ghost, you're not you don't do part of what needs to be, and leave the other part. You don't, the Holy Ghost doesn't operate, the Holy Ghost doesn't show favors. Holy Ghost doesn't operate like that. Now, there are a lot of people that go to churches and organizations and declare that they have the Holy Spirit, but really they have, a, they have an, a, another spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. Jesus said there, are, there, are, there, there will be false Christs, that's right. There will be false Christ. There will be false prophets, and there will be false spirits. And a lot of people have a spirit of the world, and it can make them dance or make them talk a foreign language, or but it's not the Holy Ghost, and it makes them go inside of buildings that they call church, but it's not the Holy Ghost. And so all of this, and I think the larger question will be this. Let's say, for instance, you just. You just you say, well, I got the Holy Ghost, and yet I've never I've never supported you financially, uh, and I I do have resources. I spend a lot of my resources on other things, my money. I and I but I've never and I've just I, and I've never given to you and I'm I, to you what you what you're doing there in Harlem and Atla. I've never and I don't want to, but I still like listening to you. Um, but let's let's look at it this way that then what would what do you think the devil would best profit from what do you think the lord god almighty would best profit from by that i mean this let's say that you the devil that atla is really true it it is the it is the truth it is the place that jesus is coming back to it is the place uh, that when the people shall be blessed with houses and land that they didn't have to build or buy, and it'll be the place where Jesus will spend one thousand years. Let's say that's actually true. What would the devil be? What would the, if the devil had to make a choice? If the devil had to make a choice in terms of control, what would be his control? Would he say, "Well, I'm not going to have you listen to him, uh, but I'll let you give to him." <laughs> or would he say, I'll let you listen to him, but I'm going to seal your heart and I'm going to seal your mind. I'm going to put a spirit of, of, of anti-truth in your mind, even though I let you, the devil said, I'll let you listen to Pastor Manning. I'll let you listen to him, but I'm going to seal your spirit where you will never give him a dime. You will waste money. You will waste money on cars. You will waste money on shopping. You will waste money on gifts. But the devil has sealed you. He'll let you listen. He'll let you listen. 
but he has sealed you where you can't give. And you'll give to other things and other people, but you will not give to the, you will not give to the prophecy of Atla, the, re, the place where Jesus is going to return to. And that would, that would, the devil don't care about you. Listen to me, as long as you don't help do the work. As long as you don't help do the work. And, and, and that would be the case. But I, I think we spent some time there. But let's go back to the fact that salvation is not possible once the door is open, closed rather. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back after the tribulation has destroyed most people on the planet. And I think our second item that we need to get to is some saved Christians will perish uh, in the wars and in the earthquakes. So, Mr. Engine, if you'll bring up Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. First of all, yeah, thank you, bring that up first. Uh, in our list of items, there are five items that we have been, uh, through our Revelation teachings, been able to discover and discuss beyond what has been discussed uh, previously. There'll be some saved Christians. Now, there are some Christians that there are going to be wars. Jesus said, you know that. You've been around the church long enough to know that. There are going to be earthquakes, you know that, and diverse places, you know that. There's going to be famines, people are going to die. People are going to die in wars, they're going to die in the earthquakes, they're going to die in the famines, they're going to die in the pestilence. And many of these people will be people that are actually saved and who actually do have the Holy Ghost. They're just not the elect. Many, will, many of the people that will die in the wars Many people that would die in the earthquakes of diverse places, the pestilence and the famines, will be people that are saved, that are filled with the Holy Ghost, but they have, they have not been chosen to be a part of the elect. Only the elect will survive these items throughout the length and breadth of the tribulation. So we, we need to understand that. We need to be clear about what that um, what that means. So in verse 6, Mr. Engineer, take us to verse 6 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. In verse 6 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, it speaks about the wars, the rumors of wars, the famines, the earthquakes, the pestilence. And you've heard that a thousand times if you've heard it once. You know it's going to happen. Well, we're in it now, and it's only going to get progressively worse. The um, And in the process... Humanity will die. Earthquakes are coming to a, a town or to your place where you live. Uh, wars are coming uh, to where you live. And if you look at uh, the engineer will bring up for us verse 6, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see there be not trouble, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. A nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. Now, people are going to die in these events. And many of the people that will die in these events will be, will be unsaved people. Many of the people that will die in, this, in these events will be unsaved people. But many of them that will die in this will be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I'll explain that as we go further. And there shall be famines. And I'm led by the Holy Spirit to say once again that, uh, Mr. Engineer, Go back to verse uh, one of this this very same chapter. Um, the uh, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye all not all these things? Verily I say unto you that not not there shall not be left here at one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. In other words, Jesus said the temple will be torn down, and it was. It was torn down in 70 AD. The Romans came and burned it down, knocked it down, tore it down, and it was a magnificent temple, but it tore it down. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus tore the temple down, do you think that's where he's coming back to? If he was coming back to Jerusalem, or Israel in particular, he would have left the temple and would have protected it with his very life if he was coming back. Now, some of you may know this or may not know this. The El Oscar Mosque, you've seen that gold dome 
I don't know if the engineer could pull it up, could show it to us. It's the Al Al Oscar A S O Mosque. It's the it's the it is the Mecca of the of in Israel. The the Muslims now that the now have put on on that holy mount on Temple Mount is what it's called. It is now the Muslims' headquarters, the Al Oscar Mosque, and that Jesus is not coming back to that mosque. So that much you know, not only spiritually and scripturally is true, but geographically, Jesus is not coming back to a Muslim mosque. Now, anybody who knows anything about, about Jewish geographical history knows that that mosque, that mosque is now El Oscar Mosque, now sits in the same place where the temple was, where Almighty God slept in the Holy of Holies, where Solomon built, where the people worship God, on that very same parcel of land that is where uh, Moses, I mean, where Abraham offered his son Isaac, is now the Muslim mosque. That is a Muslim mosque. It, that is where the temple used to be. It's been torn down, and the Muslim built their mosque there. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus is coming back and going to live in that mosque? You know the answer to that. No, he's not. You think Jesus is going to come back and live in Jerusalem where that mosque is at? Yeah, I, you probably now know that he isn't. And that whole bit, all that business about the red heifer running across the altar, there is no altar for the red heifer to run across. So here's what some Jews have done, is that they have developed the theory of the third temple, that they're going to build a temple in the place where... Um, where Jacob and uh, lay down at Bethel, where Jacob lay down one night and put his head up on some stones to go to sleep. I don't know how he did that. And when Jacob fell asleep, he saw the angels ascending and descending out of heaven on a ladder. We call it Jacob's ladder. Some Jews who have not accepted the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, who have not accepted the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, have developed this theory that to, there's going to be a third temple built for the red heifer. And that third temple will not be built in Jerusalem, but it will be built in Bethel where Jacob fell asleep that night on his way running from his brother Esau. So here is, here is the, the analogy. Now, come up very close because you need to hear this. The Jews that have not accepted Jesus have not accepted the fact that Jesus tore down the Jewish temple. He tore it down the same way he's going to tear down your religion, the same way he's going to tear down your church, the same way he's going to tear down your doctrine. Jesus tore down. He's going he's to definitely tear you evangelicals down, you Baptists, you Methodists, you Pentecostals, you Catholics. He's definitely going to tear down the Vatican. He's going to tear it down. Now, he tore, he tore the Jewish temple. He's going to tear yours down, too. You may not believe it, but he's going to tear it down. It's worthless. But here's what has happened. Satan has come along and said to the Jews, well, you don't have to believe in Jesus, just build another temple. But you can't build it now where the mosque is because the Muslim will cut your throat. So you got to build it someplace else other than Jerusalem. Go out to Bethel where Jacob fell asleep, where there was a ladder going back and forth to heaven and build a third temple. Now, it ain't going to never be built, but that is the theory that the Jews will refuse to accept the truth about Jesus. They refuse to accept Jesus. But let me go you one better. There are evangelicals. There are people that call themselves Christians. Now they're not. They're Southern Baptists. They're, 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 they're Methodists. And some are even Pentecostals who believe in the pre-tribulation. Now they're not going to be taken out of the earth before the tribulation happens. It isn't going to happen. There's no biblical. There's nothing to structure it. They, they, they twist the verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. But here's what they do. Just like the building of the third temple at Bethel, which ain't going to never happen, and it's only in defiance of the fact that Jews will not come to Jesus, they will not come to the blood of Jesus, and they're still trying to build a temple and hoping all, that Jesus will come to that temple, that, that God will come to that temple. It is ridiculous. It is, but what is equally ridiculous 
is the idea of a pre-tribulation, the evangelicals. What is equally, uh, if you will, ridiculous is the whole idea of the Baptist doctrine and the Methodist doctrine that don't worship on the Sabbath, that don't give this, who refuse to honor the Sabbath. They just outright refuse to honor the Sabbath. The same way the Jews and, and the building of the third temple refused to accept Jesus as Lord, there are evangelicals and other so-called Protestants and Catholics who refuse to accept the Sabbath as a day of work. They, they won't do it. They, they'll build their Sunday temples everywhere. And so the devil has done that. The, de the devil has told the Jews, build a third temple. Jesus tore down the temple. If Jesus wanted that temple that Solomon built, that Herod remodeled, if Jesus wanted that temple that Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt, if Jesus, nothing on earth could have destroyed it. Jesus himself tore down the temple. So imagine the, 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 the gravity that the devil has on Christians and Jews in their mind, and they refuse to accept the truth. After Jesus tears down the temple, they say, well, we'll build another one in another place. And we'll have our God come and visit our temple, even though he tore down the one that Solomon built. So when I, when I rise up to teach and speak and give the prophecies of Almighty God, that is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at people who refuse to accept the Sabbath as the day they just refuse to do it. The Jews, they refuse to accept Jesus as Lord, his blood. As Lord, they refuse. They refuse. And the Christians refuse to accept the Sabbath. They refuse. They refuse. They refuse. So the Jews said, and I was in Israel, quite frankly, 10 years ago, I think it was. I took a group of 25 people over to Israel, over to, Israel to the Holy Land. We were there for, for two, 10 days, I think. And uh, we went to that place. In fact, we didn't even go to Bethel because it was in the West Bank. But we stood up on a platform, looked like a place where you store crude oil, um, and they pointed to the place where the new temple is going to be built. I, you know, I didn't. I did, our, our our tour guard was uh, was Jewish, and I'd already had one argument with him on Mount Olivet. <laughs> so I figured I'm not going to argue with this guy anymore. They, they, they don't want to believe that. Let them believe it. But when you look at how the devil wraps the minds of the Jews and, and re tells them to refuse to accept Jesus, who was born a Jew. He refused to accept their blood. But we'll work on that. What is equally fascinating is how, how the so-called Christians refuse to accept the Sabbath day. Well, we can worship on any, like the Jews say, well, we're going to build a temple, a third temple. Uh, the, the, the Christians say we can worship on any day we want. It, 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 and you, if you, if you, for just one moment, if you could stand inside my shoes, when I see a preacher who brings people into the church, especially after he hears the truth and he knows the truth, or a person such as yourself, listen to me, going to go back to that church on Sunday, and when you know the truth, you, you know the truth. It, it's like Jesus tearing down the temple, and the Jew said, and, and then dying on the cross to save all people, born a Jew, Yet the Jews said, we're waiting for uh, him to come, and we're going to build another temple, even though he's tearing down this one. We'll, we'll worship where we want to. We won't worship in Jerusalem. That's the place. That was, a, that was once the holy place. We'll now go to Bethel, where uh, uh, Jacob saw the ladder going up and down. And that's what the Christians said. We'll, we'll worship on Sunday the way. And, and it is amazing. So that brings me to a larger question, or a larger fact, I should say. It, it brings me to the magnificence, first of all, of anybody who is truly saved, full of the Holy Spirit. If you're truly saved and full of the Holy Spirit, you're going you're gonna to give everything you have in terms of your sacrifice, your commitment, and your love to this teaching that I'm doing. There will be no hesitation. There will be no two churches you belong to, no two ministries that you go to. If you are fully saved and full of the Holy Spirit, that's what you're going to do because the Holy Spirit is not two-tongued. The Holy Spirit is not two-faced. I'm telling you, if you have the Holy Spirit, he is not going to be comfortable going inside a church on Sunday morning. And then listening to me on Saturday, he, the Holy Spirit don't he doesn't do that. Now the devil does that; he lies out of both sides of his mouth. 
But if you truly are saved, if you truly have the Holy Spirit, there ain't no way you're going to violate the Sabbath. Just, you're not going to do it. The Holy Spirit doesn't. The Holy Spirit leads and guides in the all truth. Now, you may have a spirit. You may have some sort of worldly spirit, demonic spirit, witchcraft spirit, uh, denominational spirit, racial spirit, cultural spirit, homosexual spirit. You may, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not play games. He will not. The Holy Spirit will not disavow the, the, the Sabbath. The same way the Jews disavow the blood of Jesus and say, well, we're going to build a third temple in Bethel and we're going to worship there. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. So it brings to the larger fact that I mentioned just a second ago of this. Now we understand why Jesus is going to destroy planet Earth, why he's going to Earthquakes are going to rearrange the continents, the oceans, the rivers. The, the earthquakes are just going to break the place up and rearrange everything except Atla. There are going to be famines and pestilence and wars even here in America. And death is going to rise. You, because you would, my larger fact would be this. Why is it that Almighty God is going to destroy Earth? Why don't he just, why don't he just wave a wand? And everybody, the Buddhists, the Muslims, the Hindus, the communists, the Confucius, you know, the Hare Krishnas, the Baghdad Gitas. Why doesn't Jesus just wave a wand and everybody will say Jesus is Lord? Everybody will honor the Sabbath. Why doesn't he do that? Why doesn't he do that? Well, there are a couple of reasons we can, way we can look at that. He's not going to do it. You say, well, the, the, the alternative is, is that he's going he's gonna to send a series of, of destructive forces to get rid of everybody who will not hear. Let me say this to you. When Jesus put Adam and Eve in the garden, he could have waved a wand and, and said, not only don't, don't touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but he could have waved a wand and said, and, and put a fence around their lives and they would not have done it. But he didn't. He allowed them to have the free will as you've heard speaking a word, I've, a, a choice of words I very seldom use, free will. But he allowed them to be able to, to destroy themselves through that process. And at that point, he spoke death. Now listen to me very carefully. When Adam and Eve blew it out of the garden, at that point, Jesus spoke death. And when he spoke death, the tribulation has to run. There are competing factors in the total universal scheme of all things spiritual. Keep your mind on the building of the temple and not honoring the Sabbath. There's a, when Jesus spoke death, he also put in place eternal life. These are two competitive competing entities that have no physical, they have no, if you will, quantum physics, they have no quantum in terms of their material, if you will, presence or observance or perception or understanding, both death and eternal life. So when Jesus spoke death, which is in the spirit of Satan, and Eve responded to it, and Adam did too. Eternal life was put in place. So when Jesus came, now these are two entities. They have no geographical bounds. They have no physical bounds. They have no philosophical bounds. They are imminent in terms of a reality. Death is real, but eternal life is real. Now listen very carefully. Every last one of us have seen and understand the tragedy of death. We know it's real. We know it's real. It hurts. It's painful when those we love die or when we have to think about it on our own that we're going to die. It's real. We know it. What we don't know without the Holy Spirit, what we, without the Holy Spirit, we don't know eternal life. Now, we've heard about it but we don't experience it. The only way you can experience the whole, uh, eternal life is you must have the Holy Ghost. You must be born again out of the life that Jesus pronounced death into and born into the kingdom of God, and you can understand what eternal life is. Now, you've heard it preached. 
You've heard John 3, 16 a million times if you've heard it once, but you don't know it. You know death. Every last person listening to me right now know what death is. They know what it is. They know how tragic it is. But they've heard of eternal life, but they don't know it. And the, reason, the only way you can know it, I don't care who your father was, who your grandfather was, if you are not born again, you don't understand eternal life. Therefore, therefore, the Jews, the Jews who, Nic who Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're a Jew, but brother, you got to be born again. I know you were born of the seed of Abraham. Brother, you got to be born again to understand what eternal life is. So therefore, the Jews don't understand Jesus, don't understand the, the temple don't understand tearing down and talking about building a new one. And, and also they're, they're Christians who don't understand eternal life, so they reject the Sabbath. They reject it because they don't understand eternal life. They don't understand it. They don't understand eternal life is in the Sabbath day. When Jesus rested on the Sabbath, everything was complete. Everything was in its eternal mode. Everything, that's what the Sabbath means. It doesn't mean that God was tired, had to wash his hands, that he would, wanted to go to sleep. He needed a sleeping pill. He needed more covers. That's not what the Sabbath means. It means that it was eternal, it was complete, and therefore he rested. That, that it, it was eternal, it was an eternal, if you will, if you approval and authority, an eternal stamp on creation, on the sun, on the moon, on the stars, on the elements, on the water, on every fish that, and every fowl, that's what the Sabbath means. And until you are born of the Holy Ghost, you will not honor the Sabbath. You, you just figure out, just do whatever, because you don't understand. Now, you understand death, but you don't understand eternal life. And you can't, you can understand death without the Holy Ghost. You can understand death without the Holy Ghost. You don't have to have the Holy Ghost to know what death is. You know death is real. You don't have to have the Holy Ghost. But before you can understand eternal life, the Sabbath day, and the prophecy of God, and the tribulation, you, you have to have the Holy Ghost. So here's an even larger fact. So now we discover the temple is torn down. They're gonna build a third temple, a red heifer, pre-tribulation nonsense. Or lie, I should say. It's not nonsense, it's a lie. Without the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, I have many things to say to you, but you're not ready to receive them now. And when I send the Holy Ghost, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. The eternal life, listen, there is no way if you have the Holy Ghost and the and someone like myself teaches you about the Sabbath, would it be that you'll ever go back inside of a Sunday church for the purpose of thinking that God's there to worship with you, thinking that God's going to meet you, he's going to violate his own word. God's going to, I mean, just the absurdity, ridiculous of that, that God's going to violate his own word and walk into a brick building on Sunday morning to meet you. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. It's beyond ridiculous. But until you have eternal life, like the Jews who don't understand Jesus, nor accept him, some of them, you won't understand, you will never understand the process of the Sabbath day. You will never understand the process of the first fruit offering. You will never understand the alignment with the tithe, the first fruit offering, the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, those three. You will never understand, and you will reject all of them right out of hand. You will just reject them until you receive the, the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a larger question. So then why doesn't Jesus just wave a wand and everybody, all the Buddhists, all the Baghdad, Gita worship people, all the Muslims, all the communists, all the everybody, all the Catholics, all the everybody would just say with one voice, Jesus is Lord. Why don't they do that? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked. It's a great question. Let me ask you this question. Jesus is Lord, isn't he? Right? He is Lord. Well, why don't the Muslims worship him as Lord? Do they know about? Of course they know about. Muslims know more about the Bible than they know about the Quran. So why don't they worship him? Isn't that an interesting question? I mean, why is it that these people are so hard-headed? <laughs> why don't they just bow down and worship Jesus? He's Lord, isn't he? I mean, why doesn't everybody on planet Earth? Why, why you got running here talking about Buddha? 
and the 14th Buddha and Hindu and all the Hindu gods and Nirvana. What is it with y'all and all that nonsense about a god with all these different arms and all these different places and Nirvanas and Hindu? What's wrong with y'all? What, 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 what's your problem? You would say, right? Why doesn't why didn't God hit these people in the head? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you know that the Sabbath day is the day to honor God? <laughs> Do you know that the first fruit offering to the house of God, to the priest of God, is commanded? It aligns with the creation itself, the first fruit, the first fruit, the first of everything, the tithe. Why don't you do it? <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, you can criticize the Muslims and the Hindus for not worshiping God and going along with their phony religion. But now when it comes to you, why don't you honor the Sabbath day? Why don't you honor the first fruit offering? You're just like the Hindu. You might as well be a Buddhist. Here, here's the deal. You know why the Buddhists don't do it? Because they got another religion. Buddhists got another religion. They got another idea. They got a Buddha that they, that's comparable to Jesus. The Buddhist, Buddhist religion is basically a humanitarian religion where the, where the spirit of the Buddha and uh, enters into a person that usually at birth and usually a male and he reigns and rules until he dies and he walks as a Buddha. He's a sitting Buddha. He's a laying down Buddha. And then he dies on another Buddha. So far there's been over the history of time, I think there's been some 14 different Buddhas. If I'm correct, there may be more now. Hindu is a religion out of which Buddhism has flourished and Hinduism uh, has many, it basically deals with reincarnation where you're born a frog or you're born a man and you become a frog and you become a cow and you experience all these things and you come back and you put all this in a reality that is a unity, if you, if you will, with all of things that are, that are living. You can become anything in the, in the Hindu religion and many people believe in the Hindu religion. It's, it's the devil's way of keeping people from the truth. You say, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and you'd be right. But what about you? And the religion, because you believe different from the Catholics, don't you? You don't believe in the Sabbath. You think that you don't need the Sabbath now. You, you can just do what you want to do. You, God will meet you when you want him. He'll come to your brick building on Sunday. Even though if you anybody who has the Holy Ghost looks at that those those verses or first four verses in Genesis chapter two, where the Holy Ghost writes about the Sabbath, it is it is the sealing of creation. It is like you put you can some tomatoes and boil them and and then you put a a lid on it and seals it. You can't seal. The, the Sabbath was the sealing of creation. It is just as permanent in its place as the sun itself. You can't take the sun that, that presently where it's at, at 93 million miles away from planet Earth, and move it to 150 million miles away from planet Earth. Or oh, I think of that, yeah. It would, then the sun would not have its effect. You can't take the day of worship from the Sabbath and move it to Sunday. It's ridiculous. It is preposterous. It is ludicrous. It is when a preacher who, if he hasn't heard the truth, which many of us hadn't heard at one point in time, but once you hear the truth, you can't take the ceiling of creation. It would be like to say you can worship on Sunday and the Sabbath, is, which is the ceiling of creation, it would like say, where well, the oceans have no boundary, they have no tides. If the Pacific Ocean wishes to just keep running until it runs across California, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, all the way over to Oklahoma, because it has no boundaries. If you think that the Sabbath doesn't is not the boundary of creation, and you can't move it, you can't move the Sabbath to Sunday. You can't do that. It's immovable. 
So why is it that the Hindus and the Buddhists do what they do? Because they have a religion that tells them that, that they're reincarnated and that, they, that they're, there are many different gods in many different forms. Same the Baptists. They have their many do, the doctr, doctrinal denominations. So here comes Pastor Manning, and he teaches. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're a Jew. You are a privileged class. You are the privileged class as nobody on the planet like the Jew, you are a privileged class. But Nicodemus, I got a word for you. Nicodemus, I got a word for you. Until you are born again, you are not going to be able to see the kingdom of God. Until you are born again of the Holy Ghost, you're not going to understand Pastor Manning when he teaches you. Oh, you're privileged. Oh, you, uh, you a Jew. You're born of the, of the Jewish blood, the seed of Abraham. You got it going on. Ain't nobody like you. But until you are born again, Nicodemus, until you are born of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit wasn't in the earth, Nicodemus. He wasn't in the earth until I finished up my work and I sent him. You got to be born of him. If you, until you're born of him, you will never understand what Pastor Manning is teaching. You will never understand. Though you're a Jew. Though you may be. So that's the issue with, uh, I think Minister Honecker made, Minister Honecker made mention of that. Uh, in one of his last postings, I said I was going to read it. <laughs> but it's uh, and I will read his postings when he read when he makes to me that unless you have the Holy Ghost, you don't understand this. Oh, you can go into these buildings with these brick buildings with altars and red carpet and purple carpet and blue, but until you have the Holy Ghost, you won't understand that the Sabbath is a sealed date. It can't be moved. It cannot. <laughs> It cannot be moved. You can't move the Sabbath to Sunday. You can't do it. It's then the devil will tell you that you can. But you don't understand that unless you have the Holy Ghost. So we started out by pointing out that when Jesus returns, this is where he's coming back to. And Jesus gave us the great example by tearing down the temple. And now the Muslims have built Jesus is not going to return to a Muslim land. He's not going to return to the Al Oscar Mosque. They're in Jerusalem. That they got that great big old mosque there now where the Muslims go in there and they make Juma is what they do and listen to somebody read, you know, from the Quran about jihad. <laughs> but they where Jesus is coming back. He's coming back here. When he comes, he's coming back here. If you have the Holy Ghost, you say, Well, Pastor Man, I listen to you but I'm not committed to you. That's because you don't have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, let me tell you something, the Holy Ghost is not a two-timer. He just doesn't do, he doesn't, the Holy Ghost is in truth. The Holy Ghost is not about various decisions, opinions, and confusion. The Holy Ghost is not a two-timer. The Holy Ghost is about truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The Holy Ghost does not listen to Pastor Man and then turn around and, and go and listen to Louis Farquhar. The Holy Ghost, he will, not, he will not let you feel comfortable in that, in that brick building on Sunday morning. He won't let you feel comfortable in there. He, the Holy Ghost, he will not, when he knows that Jesus, that this is the place that Pastor Manning, that I am, getting ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will not let you sit there and, and not help this ministry, not financially support. He wouldn't. He will not let you feel comfortable. He will not steal. The Holy Ghost will not rob God. The Holy Ghost will not rob this ministry. The Holy Ghost will not steal. You know. You know. There, you know, there are people that that you know that listen to me, but they don't come clean when it comes to to the whole process of what they get, how much money they have. They. Mm -mm. They steal from God. The Holy Ghost doesn't steal from God. Now, there are some people who give five times more than they have. That's because the Holy Ghost just tells them to give it and they give it. But listen to, listen to me. There is no way if you have the Holy Ghost that you will not tithe to this ministry. The Holy Ghost don't steal from God, the Father. He won't do that. He will not do that. The Holy Ghost will not steal from God and feel comfortable doing it. <laughs> you see, so Nicodemus, unless you have the Holy Ghost, you can't see the Sabbath day. Unless you have the Holy Ghost, you can't see Atla. Unless you have the Holy Ghost, you can't see the place where Jesus is returning. You're going to, you're going to what the Jews are thinking about doing, planning on doing, is building a temple in a place called Bethel. 
This absolute, if you've not heard that doctrine, I'm sure if you've been around the Southern Baptist, I know Southern Baptists have heard that doctrine about building a new temple. The Holy Ghost is not going to build a temple when Jesus is already, he's not going to let you participate in the building of a temple if Jesus is already hung on the cross. Let me leave you with this. There are two things, the eternal life. There, there, there are two entities beyond the deity, beyond God himself, and that's death, which you know, and life, which you know. Um, you, you see death because you're born into death. You're born the flesh of death. You're born under the curse of death. That's why you see it, and that's why you can explain it. Preachers can get them to preach about it. Church mothers can get them to talk about it. Soldiers can talk about it. Great writers and poets can write talk about death. They know it. But eternal life, they don't. You don't know about eternal life if you've never been born again. Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you can't know about something that you yourself don't know. Nicodemus, except you be born again, you will not know what the kingdom of God is. You will not know that God is building Atla for his place of return. You can hear about it, but you won't know it. Nicodemus, except you be born again, you don't know what eternal life is. See, Nicodemus, you have life in this life, which is a life of death. But except you be, you got to be born one more time before you can understand eternal life. Those two entities. If you have the Holy Ghost, then you're committed to the teachings that I'm doing and you're fully supporting it in every way that's possible. For the Holy Ghost will not rob God. Will a man rob God? Will a man lie about how much money he gets, what he has, how much he gets? Will a man rob God? Will a man lie? A man will lie and will rob God, rob his church. Will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? Sure he will. Will the Holy Ghost rob God? Whoa, now that's different. No, he will not. No, the Holy Ghost will not rob God. He will not. He will not. Will the Holy Ghost disobey the Sabbath? The sin? Will the Holy Ghost be foolish enough to think you can move the seventh day to the sixth day? Will the whole, to the first day, pardon me, will the Holy Ghost move the, the, the creation of God? Jesus said this about the Holy Ghost. When he comes, he will not speak of himself. Only those things that the Father have said, he will not come up with any new doctrine. He will not come up with any new, he would only say, the Holy Ghost will not move. The Sabbath day is the seal of, of creation itself without the Sabbath day, creation will be floating around in outer space. Oh, some over here, something over there, some over here, some up yonder. But the Sabbath is the sealing of all of that. And the Holy Ghost wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't tamper it. We got some columns in our church building. You probably not see them. Our camera doesn't cover them. And to get more seating space, we needed more seating space in our church. At one point in time, I thought, well, we can move the, if we move those columns, that'll give us more seating space. I called in a, 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 mecha a, a mechanical engineer. It was a mechanical engineer, a structural engineer. I called a structural engineer. And he came and said, if you move those ceilings, the building's going to fall down. Those, seal, those columns, rather, you move those columns, the building's going to fall flat. If you, because it is those columns that support the building. You can't move the Sabbath day to the first day. You can't do it. Otherwise, well, Nicodemus, except you be born again. Except you be born again. You will rob God. You will not commit to the teachings of Allah. You will not know eternal life. You will die, and you will know what death is. I'm James Evan Manning, everybody. I've not completed the teaching. I'll be back with more.
Jesus. One day I'll see the angels too. One day I will see Jesus. One day I'll see the angels too. because I am a roaring lion crying out, Rise! 
consciousness. Welcome, everybody, to the Manning Report, and welcome, especially Sister Angela Can Y'all know her? <laughs> uh, look at those great skies we've got here. Um, and I, I have to tell you this, that um, I, I'm planning on taking six or perhaps seven weeks from, let's say, probably the beginning of July, or mid-July, rather, uh, to late August on, on vacation. And what I'm going to do uh, is that I'm going to have a lot of people fill in for me uh, on the Sabbath uh, worship. But also what I plan to do, I plan to buy me a really nice nice car, a, a nice luxury car, too. I'm going, I'm going to spur, the old man going to really go all out and spurge on himself this time. That's me. But you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> uh, Elder Floor, here's what I'm going to do. I, I tell you right now, here's what I'm going to do. You, you ever see these people that sit in their car and do and make videos? <laughs> you ever see it? It'll become like this fad. And this, by the way, this is not something. It started about 15 years ago. People used to sit in their car on the driver's side, the passenger side, and do video, make videos, right? You ever see that? And it's, it's very popular. It seems like it adds something to the video that no one has ever seen before. At least we'd rather sit behind a desk like the person myself with a suit and tie. People, that probably, people probably think I'm all stuck up. You know, I always got on a suit and tie, look like an insurance salesman all the time. But no, here's what I'm going to do, Elder Floor. Here's what I'm going to do, Elder. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to have Captain LaFleur put a, a, a camera uh, in my car, in my new car that I'm going to buy. And while I'm driving down the highway, I'm going to do the trust of the Lord for one hour, and you'll see traffic, you'll hear the traffic, you'll see the trucks, the tractor trailers, you'll see all the mountains and everything. Well, I, you'll be able to see all of that while I'm driving. This, this is going to be great. Woo! This, this is going to be great. Now, it is. Uh, so, you, so, I'll, so I'll have Captain LaFleur set it up. So I can just sit there and drive and talk because I can do that. I can do two things. I can do two things at one time. I don't know if I can do three things, but I can do two things at least at one time. So I'm going to do the trust of the Lord every day from my automobile. And you out the window, you'll see you know other cars and all kinds of stuff like that. And I'm going to have Elder Captain LaFleur, I'm going to have him set it up so you'll be able to see a panoramic view out the back window, out the side window, see if Elizabeth's asleep or reading the Bible. <laughs> no, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I may even do that. Then now the days that I'm going to be, because sometimes I like, like I go to uh, Lake Tahoe, right? And I spend like four days in one hotel room. Well, I, you know, if I will, if I don't. But I still be able to, you say, well, Pastor Man, if you're going to do all that, then why, why are you going to go away? Uh, listen, first of, all, first of all, it's going to be for seven weeks. Um, and I don't mind doing this. It's just that I need to change the scenery. I, I need to get out, of, get out of the building for a while. I just need to you know, be able to stop at Hardee's and be able to, you know, have myself a, a milkshake and some hot dogs and some cheeseburgers from Hardee's. You ever, ever go to Hardee's? To Olive Garden, you go to Olive Garden, you know, and I can have a, a salad and I can have the uh, chicken Alfredo with the broccoli, all that kind of stuff, right? You know, because they don't have those here in New York City, right here where, where we live. So that'd be a change of scenery. And then I can go to El Capitan and, and Yosemite National Park and I can go to, um, you know, they got a restaurant out there in, in, uh, in uh, Lake Tahoe called Lucky Beaver. Best steaks you ever want to eat. Uh, I mean, they're just great. So, um, and then a lot of other places I like, I, I like to eat at, you know. I, I'm also going to, um, I'm also going to, to, to Santa Fe in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I may go to, it. there's a, there's a, I think like a hundred square mile reservation out in Santa Fe between Santa Fe and Albuquerque, where all the Indians live, right? They, they they're very native. They still send smoke signals and everything. I, I you know, I'm going to go. I, I've had reservations about doing this previously, of going to the place where Oppenheimer, well, you know, Oppenheimer, where they tested the atom bomb that they, back in 1940, whatever it was, that they tested the atom bomb. Well, I said I ain't going out there because I thought the ground was still had radiation in it, right? You know, you know me. This it took a long time to, for Elizabeth to convince me to get a uh, a microwave in the house. I ain't getting no microwave. <laughs> I, just, just, I, ain't, I ain't fooling these microwave. I don't trust them. It got you know, you know, got radiation. I be sleeping in the microwave be, well you know I'll be next thing I know I got I'll be growing a third eye or something because I had the so I wouldn't get a microwave we got one now 
but I still don't trust it, and I don't go near it. When I, when I go, if I walk by the kitchen and I see the microwave, I put on one of these, you know, you go to the dentist and they, and they, they, they do x-ray, they put on this heavy plastic black thing, looks like it got, it got a whole lot of metal in it. I put one of those things on before I go by the microwave in our kitchen. <laughs> anyway, so I, uh, <laughs> so Elder LaFleur, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be gone. Y'all can do what you want to do. Uh, you, I, you've had a, a, a Pastor Manny, you've been working him for years and years and years, won't give him a vacation, he ain't got no car. And you just work him and work him and work him. So I'm going for six weeks. I'm going to every place I want to go. I may go out to Seattle, Washington to see Amen Springfield. Y'all know him? He was at our church not long ago, Amen. I gave him that name too, by the way, Amen. So at any rate, that's what's on the agenda. So come the summertime. I can't wait till summertime comes because I'm I'm gonna have myself one big. So I'm gonna do I'm gonna do broadcasts and sitting in my car, and uh, I have my camera set. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. My engineer he's he's here right now. I'm gonna pipe it into him. He'll pipe it out to y'all live. Anyway, uh, so here what's on the agenda? Oh yeah, Trump. One of the jurors in the Trump trial. Uh, told the judge this morning, I think he or she, I can't know if it was, I think it was she, said that she could not be uh, biased. I mean, impartial, rather. Uh, so they had six jurors, now they're back down to five. Because this particular juror said that they could not be impartial. They figured they went home, talked to their friends about it, and all their friends started jumping up and down and saying all kinds of crazy things. I'll tell you this, you know, this is going to, this ju I don't, I, if they sit to seat the jury, I, you know, I, I said, I posted up something the other day. I told Alvin Bragg that he better watch himself. But I don't know if they can convict Trump. You know, if you get one person, see, a MAGA person, now, they don't want to know nothing about whether Trump slept with, you know, Carrie McDougal or Stormy Daniels or slept with a giraffe. They don't care. That's not, it will say, well, he paid money, so it wouldn't be heard, so they wouldn't, so the voters or people in America wouldn't be able to know that he had slept with the people, the MAGA people don't care. And they got 85,000 MAGA people right here in New York City. That's right. I had heard that Trump was up in Harlem. Uh, yesterday, I'm no, a Tuesday. He was over there on 139th Street and Broadway. That's well, that's Dominican Republic town. I mean, he got all them Dominicans over there everywhere you shake a stick. It's worse than El Barrio, where you got the Latinos over there on 116th Street and First and through Third Avenue, Lexington Avenue. You got all the Latinos over there. Well, on Broadway, my God, from Zion, and I'm not taking the law's name in vain. He taking the law name. Preacher ain't got no been taking the law name in vain. I don't know what drove, why did Trump go up to a, maybe because many of the Dominicans on Hunter, you're at Broadway. It's beautiful, Broadway's a, the, the, the poor people Broadway. Now there's the Broadway that, you know, that, uh, what's his name, was, uh, was singing about, Drifters was singing about Broadway. But there's a poor people Broadway. The poor people Broadway, uh, Dominicans got that thing locked up. They got banks over there, they got clothing stores. I don't think they don't have as nice hotels. But it's a, it's a, it's a, so Trump was up there at a bodega on Broadway the other day. There he is, yonder he is. Uh, and 139th Street, I was trying to figure out why didn't he come to 125th Street to Sylvia's? And you probably have to meet with Al Sharpton. But why, where is Al Sharpton? We haven't heard from him recently. But yeah, Trump was in Harlem the other day. Somebody said this is the first time that Trump has ever come to Harlem in his entire life, and it's true. I invited Trump to come to Harlem. You know, y'all do know I was on the Trump train one time. I was. And I wasn't on the Trump train because I thought that he was a, a, an honorable person. I was on the Trump train because he was a birther at that time, and my whole life had been turned upside down by Barack Hussein, the long-legged Mac Daddy Obama's illegal presidency, and Trump was a birther. And said, I figured, well, he can fly out to Honolulu and get the information. But when he said Obama was born in America, I got off the train. But before that happened, I invited him to come to Harlem. And I, I don't know if he actually said no. But everybody knows Trump has never in his 77 years of living have ever been in Harlem before. But he came now, he's looking for votes. I haven't been over to Broadway. I think that who, who lives over there now near Broadway? Who, who lives over there uh, near uh, the, the Broadway's? And Amsterdam Avenue, Amsterdam Avenue is still pretty much, you know, uh, homeboy town. But those Dominicans over there on Broadway, they 
And they've got a real strong sense of family, business. Uh, and so maybe that's why Trump, because Latinos are probably more inclined to vote for Trump. So he, he probably did a little campaigning. That's why he went up there to uh So at any rate, that's what's happening with him. And the juror said, no, I cannot be impartial. So she got off the, she got off the jury. But I was telling Alan, uh, Alvin Bragg that it might be more difficult to convict Trump than you think. You know, because... Uh, and a MAGA person, you, you could probably go and get a hung jury, jury out of this thing. Because there are, there are people who equally hate Trump's living guts. They hate him. And they just can't wait. There are people saying, can they, the judge asked, Judge Merchant asked some people, can you be, especially those two lawyers, can you be, uh, um, uh, what's the word, you know, open minded, impartial, et cetera. Um, and, um, they said, yeah, but I know they're lying. I know they're lying through their, through their teeth. So that's what's going on here in New York in the Big Apple today. And uh, I'm going to take a bit of a break, and I'll be right back so don't go anywhere. I'll find you if you do go. I'll go looking for you if you do go somewhere. God let me hear the Honorable James David Manny on the radio. And he was at 135th and 5th Avenue preaching there. And when the drug guy said, you can't preach here, you're on our territory, we're going to kill you. He said, no, God told me to come here and preach and I'm going to preach. And somebody called the captain and he came and said, take your church and your people and go back. Take your people and go back to your church. We don't want no bloodshed. He said, there will be no bloodshed. God told me to come here and preach, and I'm going to preach. I said, oh, God, that's my man. I called my sister, come and hear this man. Come hear this man. She said, who is that? I said, I don't know. But in my heart, I knew he knew the truth. So I thank and praise God for being in this house. Peace be unto you and your family. Welcome to the Atla Children's Breakfast Program. We welcome parents and their children to partake in our breakfast program from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. Monday through Friday downstairs in our fellowship hall. At 8.30, we end our breakfast program to run our elementary, middle, and high school. If you wish to inquire about our school, please speak to one of our staff. Have a blessed day. And thank you. Hola, mi nombre es José Luis Matos. Soy uno de los asistentes ministros de la iglesia a la World Missionary Church. Mi pastor James David Manning me ha pedido que le diera oficialmente la bienvenida a nuestro ministerio. Bienvenidos a ustedes y a toda su familia a disfrutar de nuestra comida y hospitality. También queremos invitarlos a nuestro servicio que se da todos los sábados a las 10 de la mañana. Si hay algo que podemos ayudarle, por favor déjenoslo saber. También tenemos una escuela desde el kindergarten hasta el 12 grado. Si desea inscribir a sus hijos, por favor contacte a la madre Elizabeth Saramani al teléfono 877-777-0734. El teléfono es 877-777-0734. Gracias. Peace. Well, hello, Dr. James David Manning. This is Nigel Farage. They call me Mr. Brexit. Now, your internet preaching in your ministry in Harlem reaches across the pond here to England too. But I'm told, like me a few months ago, the bank is trying to foreclose on your church. Now, look, being conservative, of course, makes life very, very difficult with the woke banks. But you are the kind of man with the kind of belief that can overcome this. There are banks out there that will have you. It's going to take you time and effort. If you need my help, you give me a call. James, you're going to win this one. 
Don't you worry. All right, so we got more breaking news. I just learned that another juror has decided to float the coop. So there were up to seven jurors on Monday, Tuesday evening, whenever they shut down the, the, the you know trial proceedings, jury selection proceedings, as, as it were, was or were. And uh, so everybody went home on Tuesday night thinking, well, we got seven jurors, only five more to go, and six alternates. Well, come today, well, they had a day off on Wednesday. They had to, you know, like the sleepy maids had their day off. Anybody ever know what a sleepy maid is? Anyway. Come to find out this morning, two jurors have jumped ship. Said they cannot be impartial. And uh, so now they're down to five. First there was seven, now there's only five. So mothers may jump ship as well. But what I can tell you what happened. I'll tell you because you know I know everything. They went home and they said, you're going to be in that trip. They, they, listen, they, they tell you, you've taken your life in your hands, fooling around here. You vote Trump guilty, the, the, the MAGA boys are going to come looking for you. See what they did on the 6th of December, 6th of January, rather, when they stormed the uh, the Temple of Democracy. They're going to come looking for you. Say, I'm getting off this thing. I ain't going, this ain't going. Besides, I, you know, I, if you want to write a book or you want to be maybe become a famous juror or something, you got those kind of talents, you can sit through it. But otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, in six weeks, I ain't going to get up every morning. I, every morning, I got to get up, be in court by 8 o'clock or something. No, nah, and not me. No. And I sit down on them hard benches and watch everybody. Listen, watch Trump, that orange hair blowing around, that orange stuff he got on his face. Now, the other breaking news is that the Kennedy family, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, President of the United States, assassinated. His family is going to be endorsing Joe Biden, my time Biden. Yeah, because the uh, the uh, Robert Kennedy, Bob John Kennedy's brother, that was also assassinated out there by what's that fellow name there? So what was his name there? Out there in that hotel out there with um, that that uh, that it was anyway. The uh, he was a Robert Kennedy was assassinated. John Kennedy was assassinated. So Robert Kennedy Jr. is now running for president, and he's garnering some attention. So the whole Kennedy clan, that whole clan from up there and all that bootlegging country, uh, are going to some, today somewhere somehow they're going to the whole family going to get together and endorse Joe Biden and condemn their brother Robert Kennedy. There two things. One is Robert Kennedy has the potential of drawing votes away from. Uh, from Joe Biden, my time Biden, um, and potentially from Trump as well. But more people think he'll affect Biden than he will Trump. Now, my problem with Robert Kennedy, something wrong with him. He talks like he's got, you know, why does he talk like that? You ever hear him talk? He, he doesn't stutter. Well, we don't know about it. We don't want you as president to talk like that. You can't talk to Chinese people like talking. You can't talk to Xi Jinping. No, you no, no, uh, uh. You can become. I don't know. No, sir. We don't want nobody that talks like that as our president. Then the other thing about him is that he wears those skinny neckties, right? You ever see him? I mean, he had to purposely go out and look for these because he got a whole slew of them. Every time I see, him, he got on a skinny neck, little, little skinny necktie like that, right? Here, this man, he's 50 years old wearing them skinny neckties. What's wrong with you? You know, what, get take, and, and they're all ugly, too, by the way. So his family, the Kennedy family, is going to say, can him, get rid of him. He looks like he, looks like he might be, you know, at first I thought he was retarded the way he was talking. But no, he's not retarded. He's a Kennedy. You know, the Kennedys got all that money. Their grandfather was a bootlegger. You know, so we can't be talking about John Kennedy's father, like they call him a bootlegger. Well, he was. You know, uh, the um, it, Kennedy was married. What's that woman he's married to? He didn't love her. He was married to, she got married to this guy, Aristotle Onassis, right? Jackie Kennedy, huh? I don't know why he married her. He didn't love her, right? So I think. I, you know what I would like to do? I'd like to, if you raise Jackie Kennedy up, have a, have a talk with Melania, M Melania Trump. That ought to be interesting. If I could pull that off, I'd be the broadcaster of the millennium to have Jackie Kennedy and Melania Trump talk to one another. You don't talk to Lyndon jo uh, Lady Bird Johnson, who was 
John, uh, Lyndon Johnson's wife, or oh, Hillary Clinton, who, who was, uh, I, think, I think Hillary Clinton loved, oh, what's his name, Bill. I didn't have sex with that woman. I think, I think, I think Hillary loved her Bill. I think she did. Now, where well, we might run into some dark corners and problems is with Michelle, the, the fist bumper, and Barack Hussein, the long league, and Mac Daddy Obama. We might find that was a contract wedding. <laughs> Laura Bush and, and George H.W. Bush, I think Laura loved him. I don't think George Bush would keep up a loving it. Judge Herbert Walker Bush came up. Maybe so, I don't know. But I tell you the absolute truth, what I think would be the, the interview of the century or the millennium, rather, will be to get uh, Jackie Kennedy and Melania to talk to one another. Because they, both of them got, you know, anyway, their husbands running around with a whole lot of women. What's it? Uh, John Kennedy. That boy. Uh, so, all right, okay, let's, uh, by the way, I've got, uh, coincidentally, I got a clip about uh, Trump, I mean, Trump and, and uh, the, uh, and about, uh, what's the name, Stormy Daniels. Mr. Engineer, you have clip number one, please, sir. Roll, roll that clip for me for you. Everybody, all right, sit tight, everybody, and watch this. And I am Stormy Daniels. For those who don't know who I am, I suggest you don't Google that until you get home from work. Long before she was Stormy Daniels, she was Stephanie Gregory. Born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, she reportedly had dreams of becoming a veterinarian or a journalist. She was the editor of the school newspaper and president of the 4-H club. Beneath her 1997 high school yearbook photo, a caption that reads, We will all get along just fine as soon as you realize that I am queen. <laughs> By the time she was 17, she was dancing in strip clubs across the South. Stripping was her entry into porn. Hollywood began to notice her too. Director Judd Apatow cast her in some of his comedies, including The 40-Year-Old Virgin. I was ahead of the curve on the whole story yeah. Daniels. She's very nice and super smart and, and great to work with, so we just kept asking her to be in all of our, our movies. She also appeared in this music video. The year 2006 changed the trajectory of Stormy Daniels' life. That's the year she says she had an affair with Donald Trump, after the two met at a golf tournament in Lake Tahoe. A few years later, in 2009, after Louisiana's Republican Senator David Vitter was exposed for hiring prostitutes, Stormy Daniels flirted with a Senate run. I don't see how I could possibly embarrass him more than he's already embarrassed himself. Her political dreams hit a snag when Daniels was arrested on domestic violence charges, though the charges were later dropped. In 2010, she dropped out of the race, citing lack of funds. By 2014, Daniels and her then-husband had moved to Forney, Texas, a small city outside Dallas. She reportedly took horseback riding lessons and continued to pursue her lifelong love of horses. For years, she was a competitive equestrian. Written by Stormy Clifford. Horses were a theme in a 2017 adult film she directed called Unbridled, in which she also starred. I hate to say it. In her book, Full Disclosure, published in 2018, Stormy Daniels wrote extensively about her alleged affair with Trump. Have you ever made love to anyone whose name rhymes with Lonald Lump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll call you whatever you want me to call you, baby. <laughs> she also wrote about her turbulent childhood, living in a home infested with rats and insects, also disclosing that when she was nine, she was repeatedly raped by a man who lived next door to a friend. I was nine, I was a child, and then I wasn't, she wrote. In the documentary Stormy, released on Peacock this year, she revealed a lot about her childhood and her parents' struggles. I grew up in this pretty rough neighborhood in Baton Rouge. Lots of drugs, a lot of violence. We used to hear gunshots and stuff all the time. I was basically white trash. So this is one of the only pictures I have of me and my mom. My parents split up when I was four. After my dad left, my mother sort of changed. I think it broke her heart. That little girl from Louisiana, now 45, and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donald Trump in a historic courtroom drama. Randy Kay, CNN, Palm Beach County, Florida. There are a couple of things. One is, is that I didn't know she had tattoos. Did I miss something? Uh, on, in that video, obviously, she's got tattoos everywhere, it looked like to me. Uh, but in the videos I've seen her previously, I don't ever see tattoos on her. I, I'm not, are tattoos able to be removed after you get them? 
The other thing is that the uh, Jimmy Kimmel asked her, did she ever make love to some guy named Ronald Lump? Uh, I think that was an ill-posed question. It just, I don't think that what she did with Donald Trump out in Lake Tahoe, by the way, I don't have anything to do with her when I go to Lake Tahoe, uh, well, it had anything to do with making love. I think it was having sex is what he should have asked her. So I don't know why he's making love. Nobody makes love to Donald Trump. Even Donald Trump can't make love. I don't think anybody can make love to Donald Trump. I think it's impossible. I mean, look at Trump. What, what, what would it be about him that you, what would make you think you're making love? And, and the other thing is that the, um, you know, um, they've humanized her. If this information and what I, the reason why I pulled this story is because the prosecutors, Alvin Bragg, want to present this information to the jury. Right now, I think most of us just thought about her as a porn star. You know, she's a porn star. So what? They, you know, but this video humanizes her. Raped at nine years of age. That's what she says. She was the, uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, she was the high school queen. Um, ran for senator that, uh, there in Louisiana. <laughs> Would that be a twist of fate? Senator Stormy Daniels? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Uh, this, is, this humanizes her, don't you think so? It makes her a person. She's 45 years old now. Looks like she's been through the mill. She's actually married and got a child as well, right? I don't know if you know about that. But, uh, I mean, if, if the prosecution is able to get this in and let the jury see that, they're going to be very sympathetic towards her, you know. Because uh, a lot of women, you know, get um, get abused at, at a young age. Um, and then she started stripping when she was in high school. That's, well, okay, that's a decision she made on her own. But, um, you know, I had a conversation uh, with, uh, with a couple of people in her category of life, um, and they're, they're never happy with what happens to them because they're busty and got this shape that looks like what everybody thinks that they they, they want to have sex with. But let's see what happens with this. Let's see how how Trump navigates this and how his um how his boys um um uh Cardi Cardi B. That's the person I was saying. Yeah, I, I had I had, a, I had a conversation with Cardi B. Go back a few years ago. So you know she's busty and you know got a lot of you know extra, you know, lower back, I should say. And so I asked her, I said, are you happy? And she said, no. And we were live too, by the way, on bro on the broadcast. And, I, and then probably at the time she was probably very down, uh, but she did, did the broadcast anyway. And I kind of see, I, I, and I think Cardi B probably and Stormy around the same age. Cardi B used to be a stripper. She used to be a, I think she was a pole dancer. At least that's what I, I don't want to lay any label on her that just not, I want to, you know, dehumanize her. Cardi B was a stripper and she used to work at a grocery store as a checkout girl. But she's very busty, you know. And somebody told her she ought to be a stripper. So she started stripping. And then from there, she started rapping it. And, and I don't think that girl has been a happy day of her life. And I, I think the same thing about. Um, you know, I've looked at, I'm now looking at Stormy Daniels as a different person. You know, uh, she's probably been abused by men, been handed off from one man to the other. Then she had that guy, Michael Avenatti, that attorney, her attorney stole money from that Michael Avenatti guy. He was going to representing her going back about six, seven years ago. He's in prison now doing 30 years. Michael Avenatti, him, what an idiot. So we'll see if that matter gets into the um, um, gets into the courtroom. Uh, what I want to do now um, is I, I've been teaching in the um, in the trust in the Lord hour about the, we're in the tribulation, and I'm gonna I got two videos I want to show. I, I maybe probably only just get one today, um, and I, I want to show you what what war is truly like since the um, since the civil war in America, we've not experienced it on our home homeland, but it's coming to America. And you one would think that 
And by the way, I, the other reason why I'm going to go on a seven-week vacation is because if the election, if both Trump and Biden, because they're both of them uh, aged and tr quite problematic, make it to November the 5th, and there's a vote for the president, all you know what's going to break loose thereafter. And America is going to go to war within herself. Uh, and there are other, a whole lot of other political dynamics that are going to take place um, that we won't know peace in America for a, a very, very long time. So I'm going to get rested up so I can fight the battle and I can serve the people and I can get this place ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So y'all pray for me. Uh, to take a long vacation or buy myself a really nice luxury car so I can sit there in a big cushion seat and have the car drive itself, right? Y'all pray for me uh, because after that, it's going to get pretty tough here. But I want to show you uh, what's happening in Gaza. And this is just one of, an in one of many incidents, but this one was graphically recorded of what war is like. And trust me, it's coming to America. You may not think so, but it's coming to America. But this is a graphic video about how children were killed in, in, in Gaza. Um, my political point of view on this matter, it doesn't matter on this issue, doesn't matter um, what's happening with the Muslim, with Hamas and, and the IDF or Jews and Muslims fighting one another is is, is not what's relevant here. What's relevant is that Jesus said there would be wars and rumors of wars. When Jesus gave the statement on Mount Olivet in verse 6 and 7 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, that there shall be wars and rumors of wars, he was probably about a hundred miles away from where you're going to see these people, young people dying. He's only a hundred miles away from there when he made, there shall be wars and rumors of wars. And the October 7th war, which I've called, has produced what you're going to see on this video. Miss Cindy, they'll roll that clip, please. A warning now, if you have children in the room, you might consider asking them to leave, given the graphic nature of this next report. It's about the IDF's continued operations in Gaza, and in particular, an airstrike they conducted yesterday afternoon that, according to the Holocaust Hospital there, killed 14 people, uh, eight of whom were children. One, a little girl whose name was uh, Shahid. She was 10 years old. CNN obtained video of the aftermath of the strike from her family, who gave us permission to show her face. Uh, uh, Shahid, Jeremy Diamond has the story. A moment frozen in time. The bodies of at least four children splayed around a foosball table. Laughter and shrieks of joy silenced in an instant. Blood now marking where they stood only minutes earlier. Shahed, no way. Shahed, my beloved. Her cousin screams from behind the camera. Ten-year-old Shahed is one of those children. Her bright pink pants unmistakable in the arms of the man carrying her away. With her family's consent, CNN has decided to show Shahed in life and death in order to give a face to this war's deadly impact on children. At Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital, those who can still be saved arrive alongside those who cannot. Amid the chaos, Shahed's pink pants dangling as a doctor confirms what is tragically obvious. But Shahed is not alone. She is one of eight children who died on that crowded street in Al Maghazi. The hospital says they were killed in an Israeli airstrike. The Israeli military said the incident is under review. One after another, their small bodies arrive at the hospital's morgue and into the arms of grieving parents. His eyes swollen and red, the father of nine-year-old Lujain recounts his daughter's last moments, playing foosball with her friends. This is my eldest daughter, he says. A drone strike hit them while they were playing. They're all children. Hours earlier, Yusuf was one of those children, playing alongside Shahed and Lujain when he was suddenly killed in a war he did not choose. 
his mother still clinging to her son. <laughs> Neither does this boy, who cannot believe his brother is dead. He is still alive, he cries. Don't leave him here. Amid the outpourings of grief, there is Shahid. Her blood-stained pink pants, once again impossible to miss. Dear God, what did they all do? One man cries. What did they all do? Jeremy Diamond joins us now. I mean, just the, the brutality of this war is, is just, it's horrific. Yeah, you know, Anderson, we don't always, we rarely make the decision to actually show the faces of the dead. In this case, we got the family's permission, and we felt it was important to, to humanize the victims of this war. Every 10 minutes in Gaza, a child is killed or wounded. Nearly 14,000 children have been killed since the beginning of this war. And, you know, I've seen a lot of these videos over the course of the last six months covering this, and, and there was something about the image of these children around that foosball table who died, three of whom we were able to identify at the morgue subsequently, that just was an absolute gut punch. And I just think it's important to draw attention to the plight of these children, as well as the children who've been orphaned in this war as well. Jeremy Diamond, extraordinary. Two weeks ago, seven aid workers that work for the World Central Kitchen were killed in a drone strike as well as they were delivering food there in Gaza to the, uh, the Gazians people. So less than 100 miles where, from where Jesus sat on Mount Olivet and said there shall be wars and rumors of wars, we have this modern day event. But I want to take you now 1,000 miles south and west, but same is still in the Middle East, but to another continent where Jesus... Um, sat on Mount Olivet, a thousand miles into the land of Sudan, uh, celebrating one year of war in Sudan. And we covered it going back a year ago. We gave some coverage, gave some prayer about it. Uh, but I want to show you what the war and the rumors of wars, all these wars right there in the cauldron of the Middle East. This is in Africa, um, of course, in, in, in the Middle East. Is, I picked up a book several years ago, said uh, this is oh, 40 years ago. Understanding the Middle East. Uh, this was during the days of, written during the days of Henry Kissinger, uh, and many of the, in the days of when um, the PLO, Yasser Arafat, and a bunch of other people were very prominent in what was going on in what was happening in the Middle East. And the Jews had just take forty five years ago had just occupied uh, Israel for thirty years. At any rate, Sudan is in Africa, on the, on the east coast of Africa, but it's west of Gaza. I want to show you what's happening in that war. The crisis has been unfolding in Sudan, and much of the world may not know just how dire it is. Eight million people, eight million, including two million children under the age of five, have been forced to flee their homes to escape the, hor escape the horrors of war. This is according to Doctors Without Borders. CNN's Larry Madoa reports now for us on the grim one-year marker of Sudan's civil war. 14,000 killed. More than 8 million people forcibly displaced from their homes. Accusations of rape, murder, and horrific abuses. Sudan is on the brink, begging the world to see what's happening and send real help. All countries of the world are busy with the rest of the world. But we are third world countries. No one is concerned about us. That is why we all suffered. Suffering so grave that half the population need humanitarian aid. A brutal war between the Sudanese armed forces and a rival paramilitary group, the Rapid Support Forces, just entered its second year. Nothing was spared and civilians trapped in the conflict zone are traumatized. We were inside our house when we were looted, robbed and beaten. All of this happened to us. They took our money and gold and even took my laptop. The U.S. is the largest donor of humanitarian aid to Sudan. And just days ago, Washington pledged another $100 million in emergency aid, bringing the total amount donated since the start of the conflict to $1 billion. 
but Secretary of State Antony Blinken has accused the warring parties of blocking vital aid civilians and egregious abuses. And both the SAF and RSF have carried out war crimes, including rapes, torture, extrajudicial killings, and other human rights abuses. Commanders for the SAF and the RSF have previously denied such allegations. With the world seemingly powerless to stop it, Amnesty International warns that the war in Sudan is likely to continue and cause more civilian suffering. If these strong statements and condemnation from the U.S. and the U.N. and the African Union have not worked in Sudan, so what's the fastest way to resolve the conflict? Exert pressure on the warring parties to end violations against civilians, to end indiscriminate attacks against civilians, to allow humanitarian access and uh, to ensure they are held accountable for the violations they are committing in Sudan. Larry Medowo, CNN, Nairobi. So 14,000 people killed in Sudan in one year. 30,000 or more have been killed in Gaza. Uh, 8 million have been displaced in Sudan. 2 million displaced in Gaza. And these two wars are only 1,000 miles apart from one another. And the war drums are continuing to beat and increase. Uh, I plan to travel to uh, Sudan. And I don't want you to think I'm overly optimistic uh, or naive. But when we win our cases against the city of New York and the Mellon Bank, I'm going to take a truckload of money to Sudan. I've been to Ethiopia, and I prayed in Ethiopia. I want to go back there. Uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, Eritrea, and Egypt are all on that uh, Nile River, if you will, border of the Red Sea, rather. Uh, Red Sea and the Nile River, Ethiopia, Sudan, Eritrea, uh, Egypt. Uh, and I plan to travel to Sudan and with a pocket full of money when I do win the trip. But I, I may go before then. I just may just go there and pray um, because it's tragic. A year ago when the war first broke out, I showed you how tragic it was and how barbaric um, the um, uh, we saw a movie not long ago where the fighters and they're all Hamites that are fighting one another. Soldier made a young boy, eight-year-old, shoot his mother in the head. Um, and he never spoke after that. It's just tragic. Wars are tragic. Men are evil. This world needs to be completely destroyed, and we start anew. Uh, but I do plan to travel there at some point in time. I get an opportunity uh, to go. And I may go back to Ethiopia as well. Uh, I, I want to kind uh, not kind of, but I want to let you look at a trailer. We have a Mother Shekinah's uh, video, The Extraordinary Shekinah uh, Seals, Mother Shekinah Seals, The Extraordinary Mother Shekinah Seals. Um, we got a bit, bit of what they refer to, I guess, as a trailer of a video. And we're going to be broadcasting this full screen, full length, on this coming Saturday uh, when Mother Shekinah can sit with her family uh, and watch this full screen uh, at the Outlaw Church on this coming Saturday. But this is just a trailer of it. Uh, and it's so fascinating, you could probably watch it over and over and over again. Uh, but we're delighted to have this incredible, extraordinary woman as a member of our church for so many, many, many years. Mr. Engineer, bring up that trailer of the extraordinary Mother uh, Shekinah Seals. So Mother Shekinah, let's get started with just the first question. How old are you? And by the way, it, I've heard it's not polite to ask women their age. I've heard that. But how old are you? I'm 103 years old. 103. Now, it not only is that extraordinary, but could you tell us when you were born? What was, what's your birth, what was the day you were born on? I was born on Sunday morning, July 4th, 1920. Were there fireworks when you were born on July 4th? This is uh, the uh, celebration of America. I was so far out in the country, we <laughs> rarely heard five fireworks. Well, I think they were, we only heard them at Christmas time. Oh. Uh, were you born in a hospital or were you born with a midwife? I was born uh, by, uh, before with a rhythm wife, I think. Okay. I never talk to or ask my mother or any relatives about it. But I did have two aunts, my father's oldest brother, 
Right. Uncle Milton was a, his wife was a nurse. Okay. And she always wore nurses' uniforms to church and every year she took care of sick people and helped with sick people. So I assume when well, you see you're talking. the house, and I remember when my brother was born at the house. Well, he's younger than you, right? That's all. Yeah. 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 And th- then I was born in the, sa- the same oh. way with her. Well, tell me, tell me, where were you born? What, what city and what state were you born in? That was Georgia. The state of Georgia. Oh, uh, Burke it? County, Georgia. Bur- is that something? That, or? uh, uh, Augusta is just north of Burke. Tw- well, tw- we were in Wayne, near Waynesboro, Georgia, which was the Burke County seat. Waynesboro. Don't they have a lot of furniture plants or something there at Waynesboro? They manufacture. No, it was the Bird Door country. Okay, Bird Door. They trained oh. Bird Door. Oh, oh, okay. And there was lots of cotton to pick. Oh, goodness. We're going to get to that, too. Uh, let me ask you something. So, where did you first go to school at? Uh, what school did you and I went like, to a country school. We were nine miles out in the country from Waynesboro, the county seat. Right. So, and of course, the only transportation we had were by, if your father could afford it, it was a buggy. You, a mule and buggy. And uh, my, my father couldn't afford a buggy because it was his second marriage. He had lost his first wife. Really? And my father lost her first husband in the flu epidemic of 1917. Okay. I don't know. It was a Spanish flu. When my father's wife was passed, but she. Passed in um, after ch- the birth of her f- fourth child. Okay, all right. Okay. The fourth child lived, but my f- my mother's fourth child died. So, so they moved in the house. So how did y'all get? Did y'all walk to school? You took a buggy to school. How did you get there? Oh, the country school, I think. What well, is the? It was the, oh, just one room country oh. school with a big. Hot Billy Stone. Uh, I let all of us kids sit on the front row. Yeah, I think so. I was going to the key. Yeah, now you sit on the front row of the church. And I'm the fireman. At any rate. Oh, by the way, my um, grandfather was yeah. mulatto. His father, my great grandfather, was Irish my, on my father's side. Okay. Uh, I never found out too much about my mother. Well, I think my mother was born out of red lap. Okay. Uh, well, but uh, uh, my uh, father, my my grandfather. Did did you uh, know your I think I remember seeing him come into the house. You mean your Irish mulatto grandfather? He was a mulatto. Okay. My uh, grandfather was. Right. And his children, uh, yeah, grandpa, no. My great grandfather was was in my life. Okay. My grandfather was his son. He was the one I remember seeing. He would come here all I was but a black too, riding a horse, sometimes the horse and buggy and he and he lived alone. And well, if he had a horse and a buggy, that means he had some money. I mean some income, some influence. I think he rented a buggy for the day. Oh, he was gonna take off. Because my well my father would, would would have a buggy sometimes and sometimes he wouldn't to because well, yeah, so many children, he had, when we went to church, he had to carry the rag and put all the six kids in from their previous marriage. Right. And me and my mother and the baby, and my sister and the baby would, would ride in the buggy. Uncle Willie was these guys who, he wouldn't get his hand dirty for anything. I was a green <laughs> oh, 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 I remember those times. And, those times. They, and they wouldn't come out of the country and get in their farm places. Well, well, one of them had a lot of children, but the other, the other, other one didn't have any children at all. Aunt Nitty, so she did some kind of work. I don't know what kind of work. Oh, uncle, uncle, Uncle Willie, and he was a handsome dude. I'm going to make, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a special clip of that. And he just said he's a handsome dude at 103 years old talking that kind of talk. I'm going to make a special clip of that. Uh, but what I, I, I can see. All right, it's a lot of fun. 
uh, the extraordinary of the Shekinah Seals, a national treasure. Uh, we will have the full broadcast this coming Saturday at the church, worship service, everybody together, and uh, you're going to be just so blessed. There's so much more she shared going back all those 103 years ago, uh, and she brings all of that to bear uh, with a strong memory of all those events. So we thank you for, and by the way, I want to give a shout out to uh, Minister Matos, Jose Matos, that held down the fort for us last night on the Open Rewards prayer meeting. Thank you, uh, Minister Matos, and um, for serving us as you have. I want to thank all our staff members uh, for all that you do to make this ministry go from week to week, from day to day, hour to hour. We give uh, the Lord God Almighty the praise and the glory for uh, this incredible house. Um, and our worship will be on this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock. And our young people are getting ready to go down to Disney World. Um, and uh, so there's a lot going on. I just want to keep reminding y'all, I'm going on vacation. I'm taking seven weeks and I don't want nobody saying nothing about it. That is right. So get ready for getting ready for getting ready. Uh, and, 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 but seriously, I need everyone to know that you need to get your stamina, get yourself ready. We're headed for wars and rumors of wars. We're headed for a political time upheaval in America like we've never seen before. And I don't know if you think the COVID uh, time was bad, this political COVID is going to be a whole lot worse. Um, so I'm going to be ready as the Lord's servant to be able to go another three or four years without any R and R time. So praise almighty God. Uh, who we got on tap here today? Honaker again. Minister Honaker, that song, you know, I just re re revisited that song, uh, and you don't have to do this one, but we revisited the song, I Will See Jesus, and it just sounds sweeter. I don't know if y'all been listening to it, but it sounds, when I heard it four years ago now, uh, but it just sounds sweeter and sweeter every time we hear I Will See Jesus, uh, probably one of his best productions. Uh, Mr. Holnaker said that his son John was of the uh, quality of being accepted at Juilliard. That's right. Not <laughs> listen, Mr. Holnaker's a country boy down there in Louisiana. They don't get more, no more country than that. And his son John, who uh, but his son was so talented, he was would have been accepted at Juilliard. Uh, very interesting. But the song. Uh, I will see Jesus is, um, and I don't know what's coming up, but it's just sweeter as we go. All right, Miss Engineer, let it go. Turn it loose.
Give it to you, Lord, it's time. 